Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. They're aviators, they're entrepreneurs, they're philanthropists, and they're from the UK. They are the co-founders of Vermont, and we are here for a conversation with Nick and Giles English. So welcome to America. Let's start there. And speaking of welcome to America, you guys are on a journey from New York all the way to Texas, traveling through the US. So what do you think of the US so far? What a great place, isn't it? It is amazing. And actually by doing by road, instead of flying to an airport and nipping off and coming back to the airport, doing by road you see so much of the country you'd never see otherwise. So it's a you know, beautiful, beautiful place. And you're not just doing it by road, you're doing it in classic cars, correct? Yep, we always wanted to sort of go on a proper road trip. And we thought if we got onto a modern car, it wouldn't be quite the same. And, and we got two old classic cars we had. Our father restored one of them an E-Type when we were little children. And uh, another one's a very, very old Porsche. Um, so we thought, let's, let's bring them out to New York and drive across America. And uh, you know, we're, we're here now, and uh, it's been a long run, a week of driving uh, many miles a day, and uh, it's exhausting, but what a great place. So what's been one favorite highlight so far? One highlight has to one high. Well, what it, one was uh, we did an amazing trip down through the Blue Ridge Mountains. So going from uh, basically Washington down to Winston Salem, and there's an incredible route there called the Skyline, and you're driving down there and you're seeing these incredible panoramic views to one side and then the same the other, and it's bears running across, tortoises, <laughs> nice. deer, oh, and, and I think the other one was um, going. We had uh, went to Charlotte and. Uh, uh, we went on a NASCAR circuit, so we took our cars with the pace car. NASCAR very kindly let us go on it, and that was just, what a great place was that. So that what sense. was your uh, top speed? Uh, well, they wouldn't let us go too quickly. <laughs> just 220 miles an hour. Just, 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 just yeah. cool cold trickle. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> so let's start with the Vermont story. So your father, huge inspiration, and he himself, a pilot, uh, would take you on uh, you know, his trips but also to really taught you guys how to kind of tinker around. So, so talk about your father, share your father's story a little bit. Yeah, he was an amazing guy. He was a PhD aeronautical engineer from Cambridge who just had massive talents with his hands in building things. And he restored old aircraft that we still fly today. Um, he played in a bluegrass band, so built all his own banjos. Um, but one of his big passions was watches and clocks. So we grew up around these watches and clocks. So you know, our, our child as children was being put in the workshop. There's no kicking the ball out in the yard. And go fix this watch. Go fix this watch. And, and, and that's really where this passion for watchmaking came from. And talk about the story behind even the name Vermont, because even that has a tie to a plane and a little bit of a, of a fun journey there. But, but tell the story of Vermont. Well, so Brennell started back in uh, 2002, but before that, um, when we decided to go off and set up Bremer, um we worked for a number of years, a lot more years-wise than we told our wives at the time. We, we said it would take a year and a half to set up our first watch or come out with the first watch. Was it, it like five years? It took five years. <laughs> so we're sheepishly going off to work. But, um, but the point was, that during that period, we, we developed and we worked, set up a little workshop and we developed this watch, but it took... Um, you know, three years to get to the stage when we were ready with a watch, but we needed to name the watch. Our surname is English. We didn't want to name the brand English. I think the irony would have been lost on many and trademarks would have been hard to get. Um, and actually came down to a flying trip. Giles and I were doing a couple of years after an accident I had in a plane. Um, Giles got me back up in the air and we're flying down through France. We ran out of fuel and we landed in this French farmer's field. And uh, it's well, it's, it's quite easy to do that in America or England, and you buy the farmer a bottle of whiskey and take his wife for a flight. In France, it's, it's, uh, I think it's illegal, and you get the airplane impounded. So to cut a long story short, the, the chap who came to help us was a dear old farmer called Antoine Bremont. We ended up spending sort of three or four days with him in his, in his farm, but he reminded us of our father who, had he lived for another 30 years, that uh, would have been him, you know, tinkering away with uh -huh. tractors and gliders and things. So. And so when you were looking at the name, you said, hey, what about this story as a way to honor him? Well, it was sort of, 
he, we'd said, oh, look, Anton Baron, we'd love to use your surname because it looked great and watch and mean something to us. And he, ah, crazy Englishman, what's that all about? But, but I think our father, who, who died in a plane crash, and, and Nick was in that plane crash with him, um, uh, it was very much honouring our father in a, uh, in a way that uh, he would have loved to have been around and be involved in, in building something like this and you know, carry on this lovely, amazing tradition of British watchmaking. So obviously aviation runs through your blood. And I mean, you guys have been in crazy accidents, but talk about your love still for flying and not just flying, but vintage airplanes and you're refurbishing them and, and you're still taking your families out on flights. So talk about kind of the central thread of, of aviation that runs in your blood. Well, I think as we grew up, our father did a lot of air show flying. So weekends we'd be nipping off to these air shows where it's sort of this high, shoved in the back of these old 1940s airplanes. And you grow up in it, don't you? It's, it's uh, again, something you're exposed to by your parents. And we, we learned to fly from a very early age. My father, Giles, and I were all trained with the Air Force. Um, and that, so that love, that DNA of aviation's always been in the family. And then when we got old enough, we started doing the air show flying. Um, unfortunately, I was involved in this accident, as Giles said, in 95. And that changed things a little bit. But uh, we still, Giles got me back up in the air and uh, still fly to this day. So it's, uh, and I think old planes, old classic cars, watches, it's all these beautiful mechanical things. I and mean, we don't make battery power watches. It's, it's all cogs and gears. And, and, and these things last forever. And, and as an engineer, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, uh, and, and there's always been a, a strong adrenaline rush through our sort of blood, I think, which uh, helps us get on. But this, it's all about adventure. Tie that into some of the special pieces within the watches because we were talking, you know, off camera and so many of these you have special edition watches that have literally parts of planes or, or stories that are a part of the watch. So kind of share the story side of, of building these watches. So every, yeah, every few years we come up with a limited edition watch and it all started with this uh, great friend of our family's, who, my father's, who uh, restored a, a very famous Spitfire and he had a, a, a panel of aluminium that he had to take off the plane and he's holding it and said, do you realize this was flying in uh, 1942 by a 19-year-old kid over Dresden? And uh, we looked in the clock in the Spitfire, it was this beautiful clock. So we made a watch incorporating that material and uh, it was called EP120, we only made 120 of these watches. And anyway, it flew, literally flew off the shelves and become a massive collector's item. And, and that started this whole limited edition route going and working with HMS Victory, the Royal Navy, uh, with a watch on there, at Bletchley Park, the, the original home of the code breakers in World War II. And uh, more recently, we did an amazing watch with um, uh, working with Amanda Wright, the Wright brothers, um, the great grand niece of that, of um, uh, Wilbur Norville. And uh, you know, working on that project was amazing. So it was a watch modeled off Orville's pocket watch, incorporating original fabric from the 1903 Wright Flyer. So it's, these are these wonderful projects. Well, what's quite nice about them is you, everyone has a sort of charitable angle. So for example, uh, the Wright Flyer, um, they wanted to make uh, their, the Wright family home. So Orville's home, he died in 1948. They wanted to make it into a museum. And so we raised you know, quite a chunk of money to help them refurbish the whole place. Right. So everyone we do has a sort of a, an angle a like that. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, and you get this amazing watch mechanically with huge history and it's doing a lot for charity and it's raising their profile at the same time and, uh, and, and, and it becomes an obsessional well. piece right. for us. Yeah. Well, carry that forward because even this trip that you're on here in the US, it's a fundraiser, so to speak, to raise money and awareness as well. So you, you do have where you're using the watches, you're using your actions to, to really be philanthropic. So talk about the trip right now. Well, so, what, so the trip is always going to be starting upstate New York, heading down sort of almost east to Charleston, then back west again, and then ending up in Houston. Obviously, poor old America have been through, hauled over the coals in the last few, few weeks. And um, uh, we have a, an ambassador and a good friend who's based in Houston, um, and he runs and owns a display team we're involved with, P-51 Mustangs, an incredible guy, wonderful, wonderful chap. And he does a huge amount for charity. And he set up this fund um, called the Freakin' Relief Fund uh, to help all those. I mean, Houston's been, lots of parts have been decimated. Um, and so it's, we said, why don't we combine that with what we're doing here and bring awareness to his charity and helping. So we're seeing some wonderful retailers en route and 
and uh, they're, they're bringing awareness to it as well. So it's an incredible cause. And, and an amazing fund, so 100% of all proceeds go straight to helping these people out. There's no management, there's none of right. that going on. Um, I love it. So it's, it's, it's lovely and there's, there's, a, there's a reason for doing it. Is it Victor's Fund? There's another one that you guys are big supporters of as well. So Invictus is um, probably a, a good percentage, probably 25% of Bremel's business is doing work for the military, which we're very proud of. Um, and we've been involved with a, I don't know if you saw the Invictus Games, which uh, Prince Harry is very much involved with. It was injured servicemen, of, often triple amputees doing these incredible things, uh, swimming, you know, the, almost like an Olympics for uh, for disabled uh, and uh, you know unfortunate you know military guys and girls and and we we got involved with them and again it's raising money for for their cause helping the British team get out there so I think it's uh, happening in September you know next few weeks in um, uh, Toronto so so that's a lovely thing to be involved with. and it's so inspiring these people are phenomenal people to meet. Well, and that's where I was going to go is the fact that, you know, you're, you're able now as entrepreneurs to be able to use your craft for a higher purpose. What does that mean to you? And especially, I mean, both of you have families now and, and your children to see that, wait a second, you can, you can use your profession to make a difference and help others. Does that play in at all? I think it, it really does. And I think as an entrepreneur, you are inevitably, if you're especially building a manufacturing business, you're employing people. And as soon as you employ one person, their livelihood becomes your responsibility. And we set out at the beginning to bring back British watchmaking. And everyone thinks Swiss made for high-end watches, but turn of the century making half the world's watches. The world sets its time by Greenwich meantime, not Geneva meantime. Um, um, and so bringing that whole industry back has always been the heart of what we've tried to do and, and um, bring employment to, to the UK and in manufacturing. And I think not just that, but all these other things we work with, it, it, you know, you're buying a watch that will last for, that will work in 200 years time. Yes, you need to service it. it so there's beautiful mechanical things um, and it, there has to be some soul and reason behind what we're doing. Otherwise, well, why do it? Well, and, and talk about it from that perspective. It'd be fun for you two as brothers, but share maybe one life lesson, because you said it took five years to launch this. So you thought, oh yeah, a year and a half, we'll be up and running. Five years later, it's like, ugh. So share maybe one lesson as an entrepreneur uh, learned. Tell the three-time rule, isn't it? It is, actually. We had a wonderful, um, we have a wonderful CFO who, uh, FD, she, always, she came in and she said, the three-time rule. I said, what's the three-time rule? So it takes three times as long, Three times as expensive, and uh, what's the three third? times harder? Three times harder. It's like so renovating a home or remodeling. It, yeah, it is. It is <laughs> a bit like if that. If you work off the three times rule, and um, yeah, and I think just in anything, achieve anything in life, you just have to work really hard. Right. And and you know, success doesn't just sort of fall in your lap, and uh, certainly hasn't for us anyway. And uh, it's it's just a lot of hard work to grow that. But I think passion. You know, the passion gets you through a huge amount in life. There's you have your ups and downs, but if you're Passionate about what you do, anything like you, you find a find a ne uh, an exit point, or you find a find a route to go through, don't you? And it's absolutely. Uh, and um, I'm 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 not sure working with your brother is the best thing, but we sort of can get over that. <laughs> but he's incredibly talented, sweeping the floor, photocopying, very yeah. good at photocopying. Um, but we do have to look after him. This is my charitable work: is looking after yeah. my brother. Yeah, <laughs> that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Such generosity. Uh, how is it with, with the families, too? Because I mean, that's a whole other layer is you've got, you know, you, the brothers working together, but then the family's all, you know, holidays and everything else. I mean, there, there's got to be, I think, missing your father, this kind of neat element of our families are still well connected and close. Uh, I, th I think with families, and, and especially working with, with close family, it's that there's ultimate trust there and you you all have the same end goal in mind to you know happiness for all and i think the only downside is when you work with a brother actually you talk about work and you lose some of your friendship because right. you're talking about work the whole time but, but you do have music together right we do have been a really this is why it's so great being in memphis we've been oh, in a really it. bad rock band since we're like 16 
Our repertoire hasn't improved at all over 20 years. Um, but you do have some Elvis songs in oh, there, right? We yeah. do, we do indeed. So the simple Elvis songs, you know, yeah, without, you know without any complicated anything, chord anything changes. Anything more than no. three chords, Giles gets a bit stuck. Uh, but it's um, but we're really looking forward to going to see uh, you know what you've got to offer around here. Oh, and Music shots, Graceland, you know. I'm mean, growing up. Nick always wanted to go to Disneyland, but for me, it <laughs> so was about rubbish. Memphis, and we're huge fans of Elvis. So so actually on the trip. Com coming to this whole area was just it is amazing for us. So, well, yeah, I mean, you've got Sun Studios, you've got obviously Graceland, you've got uh, Rock and Soul Museum, you've got the um, Soulsville area. I mean, there's so much history right this here is in this what's area. So special for music. Yeah. Is you, you come to this country and you often, um, you know, we, we meet Americans and they'll say, you'll ask them, you know, how many countries have you been to in Europe and where have you been? And you realize there's so much to see in this country. You know, this much on a map in the UK gets you from one end to the other, or two hours driving gets you halfway across England. Here, it gets you a quarter way across the state, and there's so much more to see. So uh, it is an incredible country, I have to say. Well, really. I still, I mean, even growing up and spending time in like Warwickshire and London and all those places, I mean, amazing on both sides to, to be able to have that. Uh, between the Beatles and Elvis and all the, the collaboration in between. So talk about, because, you know, one of the things I think that makes you very unique is the celebrities that have latched on. And I know Bear Grylls early on was a big supporter of the watches and took him out. And, you know, he's one of those adventurers and he's got his own shows and things where he takes the celebrities out. But I mean, he's literally living in the mountains for, you know, weeks at a time and living off nature and eating ants and all sorts of craziness. So, you know, he's putting the watch through the ringer, banging it on every mountain you can think of. But, but talk about kind of that side of, in, in movies, I mean, you've got Kingsman, you've got um, so many movies now that you guys are a part of. Talk about the celebrity status side of this. I think it's, we're not a celebrity brand in the sense we'll go and pay our staff to do the, the great modeling shots um, uh, on ads. That's sort of not what we're about. And, uh, but we've been very fortunate that people, famous people, have wanted to wear our watches. They want to have something which is a bit different, very exclusive. Um, and, we're, they, and we've become friends with many of these people because of that. And, and I think if it's in life, you can't try and please everyone. But if you've got the people who've got similar skill sets, they, the mindset, they, they love their classic cars, motorbikes, etc. And, and, and it sort of works that way. But it's never been something we've pushed that hard, but, but been very lucky. Who's been, and it doesn't have to be necessarily them wearing your watch, but who's been someone that you've, either a famous person or just someone important that you thought, I'm really happy and excited to have met that person? Um, Because you met princes and all sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, no, no, we, we do, we do, we do. There's some, you know, we're very like, there's so many wonderful people. You, as I was saying before, you can, um, it's not just about famous people, it's about inspirational people. Right. And you can meet, uh, as I was saying, an athlete from the Victor's Games, and you'll come out in tears. It is so inspiring. Um, and you'll meet, uh, you know, some incredible, I mean, yeah, I'm, but I'm on that, Prince Harry, uh, working with him on Invictus and came to the speech. He's the most inspirational guy, actually. We came away and, you know, yes, he's very famous, but as an individual involved with this Invictus and what he's done is, is, is amazing. So I think that's being involved with people who we feel are actually really giving something back and doing something great. That's what inspires also, us. Also, you know, we're, we're so lucky. We've got um, some amazing, uh, I say ambassadors and inverted commas, people who wear the watches and go off and do some amazing things. So we've got a couple of guys at the moment, as an example, uh, called Expedition 5, and they're off walking across the five biggest islands in, on the planet. So Greenland, you know, Papua New Guinea, Borneo, these sort of places. But they both suffered from PTSD um, pro and from the military, and they came out and they were, you know, they were wrecks for a long time. And then this has given them this, and you meet these people and you go off and see what these, some of these ambassadors are doing. Or Ben Saunders, he's walking across the, uh, the whole width of Antarctica solo, you know, doing Shackleton's route and did Scott's route a couple of years ago. You know, these people are very, very inspiring. Um, so we're very lucky. You're meeting some amazing people the whole time. Well, absolutely. And I think that's got to then go back in even further what you're doing, where it's like, look at, look at, you know, we're able to make a difference. We're able to, um, you know, be an inspiration on our end, but then how we can leverage this to do even greater good and reach even more people um, is extremely powerful. Yes. And that's, that's, um, 
if we can grow as a company and do that and uh, enjoy the process as you're going along. I think just the sadness for us is that Elvis never had the opportunity to wear a watch because that, that would <laughs> that have been, so <laughs> that would have been the, 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 you know, right up there for us. But. What about being a, an international company? So when you talk about, I know that FedEx is, is one that you're going to be meeting with as well and going to the hub here in Memphis and seeing that, um, which is you know crazy when you think of the amount of time coming in and then getting out and how that works is, is amazing. But being an international company, what are some of the, the opportunities, the challenges? I mean, how, how has that been from not just there to USA, but just all around the world? I think but international business is incredibly difficult because you have to change your strategy in each country. You need, you know, but we're an engineering business. Our, our, our daily job is manufacturing very complicated things. Um, but you then have to market them around the world and have that set up. And if we look at America alone, for a, a, a you British person coming out here, you think, well, America is one. But it's not. And what we've learned in America is that you have to treat as lots of different countries. It's almost it's a, like Europe in itself. And, and that adds That's real challenges. Point. And then your message to Hong Kong and China or to Australia has to be different again. And there's, there's you know, Nick and I, you can spend, we can spend every day of the year on the road seeing retailers, seeing customers. See, Giles goes off and sees them and I have to go and follow and undo the damage, you see. So it's... <laughs> damage it's a, control. <laughs> but, you know, both of you are on social media. Uh, I think, you know, especially now that tends to help a little bit where even... Even you know, for myself, following you before I even met you, it's like you kind of get to know both of your personalities. You get to see a little bit of that. So I think from a global audience, that helps a little bit to. Uh, to yeah, I think social media has changed the way modern, you know you, new companies, young companies can market themselves. And if you if you take the watch industry twenty years ago, it was about you spent this much in advertising, you'll get this much revenue. And that what that sort of business model worked for for decades. Now it's not like that at all. It's you know, there's a whole the whole millennial. Uh, right. sort, of, sort of age group, which which you know you use different forms of and, and you want to get messaging. to understand the personality behind a brand, and social media is able to do that. Right. And I think brands that don't actually show a personality in it, it's just a sort of faceless marketing brand, they're going to have problems going forward. And uh, um, but it's difficult. So you know, should you be with your children or, or tweeting something or Instagramming something? So that's that's another challenge. So what what do your families think of this? What, what what do your wives think? I mean, is it one of those where, you know, they um, they're now in the business themselves in the sense that it's a, it's a true family, or is it one of those where you know they look at it and think, wow, this is you know, they get to go off and have fun and, and do all the amazing stuff and like how, how is it family wise with you guys with the well, kids and family? Well, it's funny. I'm quite immersed in it because my wife Catherine she actually runs the military side of Bremel. Okay. So she's been immersed in it. For, she's worked with Charles and I for how many years? 15 years? Yeah, a long, long time. A long, long time. So, so our conversation at home is really exciting. Yeah. So, so what happened at work? Watches, yeah. watches, watches, watches. <laughs> Giles' yeah. wife is a teacher, so it's, it's, they have a bit so of different conversation. Okay, okay. So my, yeah, I have a little bit of balance, and you have to justify that this trip through America is all about work. Right, and, right. And right. uh, it's all very, it's not, we're going to enjoy it at all. So that's, that often is quite a difficult sell at home. But um, no, they, I think you know, it's, it's a lovely life and they love being part of it and seeing something grow and I think we'd be very sort of uh, difficult people to live with if we weren't enjoying it. Give me one family tradition and it can be one that you guys share together or individual with your own families but give me give me one just from a culture standpoint of some of the things that you enjoy to do either around the holidays or just not I mean it can be a favorite place to visit but give me give me one little tradition. My, mine would be, do, we, we love going on these sort of little flying trips. So you bundle the whole family in the back of an old airplane and you go off to, for example, Isle of Wight. And you, you don't quite know what you're going to expect. You, you don't book up a hotel or anything. You just go off and you go on a little adventure on these sort of little breaks because uh, you can dip over to northern France and uh, do all these amazing things. So that's, we've got quite into that. But uh, and how cool is it to show up? Because, you know, some come in with like these, you know, fancy private jets that are the, yeah, this the you're coming in at a vintage. This, that's this certainly cool. isn't that. Right. This is the polar opposite of that. And uh, use your uh, children to wipe the oil off the plane yeah, and yeah, all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff. It's, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> there's nothing glamorous about that, but a lot of fun. Yeah. Your tradition, I mean, is uh, yeah, I, amazing. I, my, I, um, I think it's sort of, my wife's a very good cook, so... We have a lovely vegetable garden, and it's a sort of you know, Sunday lunch. In, in England, it's you know, a proper roast lunch on a Sunday with all the vegetables from the garden and, and not actually doing anything. And you know, banning 
phones from the children, no one's allowed to do any of that, and it's just switching off, which, which is a lovely thing to do. It's good to hear that you have the same problems with the kids and the phones and technology uh, that we have here. Generation. Too busy watching American uh, um, films and sitcoms and all that sort of stuff, so it's sort of... Uh, so where, okay, so obviously, you know, we're, we're trying to recruit you to Memphis, taking you to Graceland, Sun Studios, everything we mentioned about, Stax, Museum, of American Soul Music. Where should Americans go? Here's your chance to, to put on the, you know, the ambassador hat for, for the UK, but where should we go and visit if we go outside of obviously the, the Vermont stores and seeing everything there? Do you know, what's, what's like, say you went to London, for example, London's a good place to start. You can go there for almost for a day and see, walk around, and some amazing sites within. You could land in, for example, one end and see Buckingham Palace, walk down the road and go and see the cabinet war rooms, which is where Churchill, all his bed, his cigar, all that sort of stuff still amazing left from place. the second. That's an amazing place. And then you can walk over and see the House of Parliament. And There's so much to see uh, within London. London's a great place. But there's also some, also you've got a much bigger country here, but we have some amazing countryside. You go off to the Cotswolds, the, the Chilterns, the Bath is a lovely... So, there are some wonderful, wonderful places. And, and the great thing is just driving through, you come across these wonderful little villages where... Pubs. Uh, and uh, Where Bramall's Basin, Henley-on-Thames, known for its rowing. Oh, it's the most beautiful little town. And um, definitely Scotland, go and visit that. Uh, I mean, you might not understand the accents, it's very confusing <laughs> up there, but, but, but absolutely beautiful countryside. Um, so there's a lot to see in England. And, uh, and you can do it a lot quicker than you can right. do, do, do over here. It's, you can really do a road trip and get it done in a week. Which yeah. is good. I greatly appreciate all you do for using your watches to give back as well, for change making and, and being change makers. Greatly appreciate you guys being on a conversation with Nick and Giles English. Thank you for watching.